the Manhattan Neighborhood Network. We just completed a program with a, a, a friend of yours, and I hope to become a friend of mine, Ruth uh, Linford, lovely lady. And we're going to want to talk about the about your career and also about the uh, International Center for Integrative Studies. And in the audience, welcome very, very much to Conversations. It's a great pleasure to welcome to the program Dr. Aristide Henry, uh, Henri, Henri. Henri Esser. He's an MD, and he's got a very interesting life story to tell. And he is involved with, among other things, of those of you who may have seen the program that aired Tuesday, with the uh, International Center for Integrative Studies. And all of that is just a brief introduction and welcome very, very much to Manhattan Network and Public Access Cable Television. Glad to be here. My great, good pleasure to welcome you. We shared a salon that I thought was very interesting uh, uh, the, uh, last Sunday and that's where we met. And I'm very pleased, but could you please share your own background, born and raised and educated, and then we can talk about some of the conditions that you're concerned with in terms of improving the human condition and so forth, but could you share your own background, please? Yes, my background is uh, I was born in Indonesia from a uh, Dutch father mm -hmm. who was a linguist, mm -hmm. and he passed away in, a, or actually uh, died in a concentration camp. He was an camp. academic. Was he was he? an academic, he uh, was a linguist, and yeah, he worked uh, for both the government and for missionary services, translation of Bibles, etc. In, in Indonesia? In Indonesia, I see, uh, for, for his whole career, uh -huh. after he left Leiden University uh, until his death in 1944. Oh, I see, okay. Uh -huh. So. Um, and you were raised there during the Second War then? I, I was born in 1930, and. Mm. Uh, so I was raised on another island because he worked on Celebes, or Sulawesi as it is called today, mm -hmm. uh, which has practically no schools and so on. I see. So as a child, I lived on Celebes, but uh, later, when I was six years old, we mm -hmm. went to Holland for a uh, for a uh, vacation, mm. uh, a rare vacation. It was his only time that he went to Holland back mm. oh, <laughs> in, really? in so many, 20, more than 20 years. Yeah. And um, after that, I stayed in Java, in Bandung, the famous place where the third, first Third World Conference was held. Really? I didn't know Bandung, that. Yeah. Yes. Really? Bandung, yes. Okay. Bandung is yeah. uh, very well known. Mm. And the word uh, Third World was coined in Bandung. Really? Okay. Yeah. Any particular personage associated Sukarno. with Oh, Sukarno, Sukarno uh -huh. was, the, uh -huh. was the man at the mm. time. Yeah. And you were raised then in Indonesia? I was raised in Bandung, primarily, uh -huh. Uh -huh. some other places as well, uh -huh. but basically Bandung until the Japanese came there and I survived the uh, occupation. Uh, from well, you were even relatively young then. They came in what, thir in 39? In or, 41. Uh, 41, okay, 41. Yeah. They uh, attacked uh, at that time, and it took them three months to overrun uh, this country, uh, Indonesia. Yeah. Uh, they were very, uh, very uh, active, and I remember very well that uh, the colonel that occupied our city, mm -hmm. uh, on the head of his troops, he came in on a on a horse, and, a horse, and he had yeah. uh, people, uh, the soldiers marching behind him, uh -huh. and we were watching it from the, from the road, and mm. he stopped by, took his hat off of his kipi, and said to my mother, hello, how are you, Mrs. Hesser? Ah. Because what was he? He was the, uh, the owner of the Sun. The Sun was a big uh, variety store with uh -huh. all types of things. Uh -huh. And before the World War, he was basically the spy that uh, connected for the Japanese and then came back to govern Bandung. I'll be darned. Yeah, yeah right, right. so for many years we had him as our, uh, basically as a friend of the home because he came regularly with presents. Uh -huh. He was very kind to my mother mm. and always very polite. Mm -hmm. And then he came back and, and we were just stunned. I was uh -huh. standing there uh -huh. with my sister and my mm -hmm. mother and I said, who's this? <laughs> it was yeah. the man. Yeah, it was difficult. So uh, yeah, it was it, difficult. I have very mixed and uh, good and bad feelings about the uh, occupation. The bad mm -hmm. feelings, of course, my father's death, my uncle's beheading mm -hmm. because he didn't want to kowtow. Mm -hmm. We learned to kowtow very quickly. Mm -hmm. you, you bowed and that was it. If mm -hmm. you didn't bow, then you got beaten up or you finally got 
Is there, uh, is, is there a lesson in living? I know you do psychiatry and so forth, and yeah, uh, whether to kowtow or not. Yeah, and how does one decide lesson. if they want to kowtow, and what do you kowtow to? Or you kowtow to every soldier you pass, <laughs> every one. Never mind uh, whether he was young, old, high rank or not. Uh -huh. Any Japanese, you had to kowtow. Uh -huh. And uh, I learned fear. Fear. And fear is very important. Okay. Uh, yeah. it made me an honest man. I'm a uh, Christian. Uh -huh. And so um, the fear of World War II hmm. uh, and the death of many people. Yeah, it was uh, awful. Made a I know. It, impression. War is such a horrible thing. You're a Christian. Indonesia is the largest Muslim nation in Ex the world. Absolutely. So you were raised and you went to university there, if I'm not mistaken? No. 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 After the World War, uh, I had not been to school for four, four years. I uh, went to Holland. At we what were age? All, all effect, evacuated. It was, I was 16 years old. 16, okay. 16. So I hadn't been in school. But you were raised until the time you were 16 in Bandung, Indonesia? In school, in primary school. In primary school, in, in the country of Indonesia? Yeah, in Bandung. And so. the language there is? Well, we spoke Dutch, but of Dutch. course I spoke Malay. Malay. We, yeah, that's not Indonesian today. Indonesian today is a mixture of Malay, uh, Dutch, and English. Oh, really? Uh, it's a totally artificial language. If I go there, I can hardly understand it. It's interesting, yeah, that's yeah. interesting, so yeah. It's, a, it's an artificial language, uh -huh. because uh, only the uh, educated people speak it. The uh, uh, Dessa people, or the people who live in, uh, in the land, speak Malay, Malay, and I can get along with them very easily. See that you can speak? Yeah. Yeah, from your youth. Still yeah. a little bit, though, not much anymore, but I can uh, get along, and I've been several times back after the, after the war, and one, uh, once I lived in this right. country, I've been back. Trouble, uh, one of the troubles is so many things you could talk about. Youthful or uh, imprinting or, or, Im, uh, or uh, early out of the womb experiences are very, very important in terms of uh, forming human uh, structure, the structure of human personality and so forth. I, Yours yes. was a unique environment, was it? Absolutely. You think it had you, it was from a linguist and he was, a, he was, he was, he was, he was assassinated? No, I, he, he was, uh, he had to fight and as such he was interned in a concentration camp, ah. and they let him die. He was mm. the official translator because he was fantastic in languages. Yeah. Uh, he had 45 languages that he wow. could speak. Wow, 45? Yes. His, Is uh, there room enough in the brain to keep 45 <laughs> languages? I don't know. I don't know. His more map of uh, uh, the languages of Indonesia, uh -huh. of which there are almost 200, mm -hmm. it, uh, Indonesia has 17,000 islands. Yeah. Um, his map is at the Yale Library, uh, because really? he made it, yeah, he made it uh, prior to World War II. No, see, the trouble is, there's too many things we could talk about. How many languages are recognized in the world as languages not distinct? Do you happen to know? Maybe you don't. It's a, it's a great 5, number. It's so about four or five hundred. Four or five hundred yeah. languages, languages in the world. In the world, yeah. Four or five hundred languages. Okay. I, I think so. Maybe. And then we have language groups. There's dialects and, and so he, on. And he was interested in linguistics. Yes. That so was he his would have probably you probably were raised with some thought about the importance of language as a major form never, of Never, because I never saw. But him. he was intellectually he was intellectually encouraging. Oh yes. To you and the he children. He came. He yeah. came the day before, actually the week before we capitulated. He flew from uh, where he was uh, slated in in Sulawesi or Silabes. Mm. He flew in. Uh, they got a day off uh -huh. to say goodbye to the family. Uh -uh. And I saw him that day. And he talked to me for about an hour. Uh -huh. He told me what to do. He told me to learn English, uh -huh. the language of the future. Mm -hmm. You know English, you know everything. He mm -hmm. gave me three books. Uh, what book? Do you books. remember? Yeah, they called Step One, Step Two, Step Three. Written in by oh 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 language. Just, yeah. How to learn English? Learning, right? learning. And you learned it from the books. Absolutely. English wasn't generally spoken or anything like no, that. No, no. no. Well, no. Be, of course, in in high school you got English. Yeah. Uh, but I never got to high school. Uh -huh. I, I was in sixth grade when the mm -hmm. when we were occupied. And then you went to Holland in the sixteen. Then in sixty forty six I went to Holland. You did right after 16. the war. There was devastation there right. around all over Europe. Right. It was a pretty devastated oh. place. It was uh, pre-Marshall Plan, pre-rebuilding, and that. Well, pre that yeah, and and we had no food. It was all uh, restricted, and uh, there was no money. Mm. Uh, I had luck because I had brought in uh, cigarettes from traveling by ship, 
uh, and you know that you was smuggled the them in. I, I used to smoke. You had nothing else to do in the everybody world. Smoked. Yeah, everybody smoked. Yeah, you had smoked nothing them. else to do. Right. Okay. Yeah, I know. And so yeah. I had these cigarettes, and I sold them in Holland, uh -huh. and everybody wanted that. Mm. And also had stamps, and I sold stamps Postage from the war oh, okay. in Holland. Uh -huh. So I had some money, and with that money, I uh, bought certain things for myself, my mm. library, and my uncle, who was a psychiatrist, took mm. me as a guardian. He was the guardian. That was your, me your father's father? He was father's my father's brother, brother yeah. yeah okay, huh? uh, he, of course, told me, uh, your father should never have gone to there, because, uh, you know, uh, he had a brilliant career here. He was mm. supposedly immediately a professor and so on at the University of Leiden, if you know, that's a very well-known mm. university yeah, absolute, language. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Language was very good. My, my maternal grand, no, uh, uh, maternal grandmother's people were from Scotland, from Edinburgh, and Very it's well Greg. Known. The family was named Greg, and it's like something out of DeVoe or something. But in the sixth, 17th century, there was a member of the family going back who had sailed into the West East Indies, and they had crashed on an island. Oh, yeah. And he went and he survived and got on the island and made it and, and survived and married a woman. And they it was called Greg Island. Hmm. It was in the in the uh, right in that area. And we had my Aunt Jane, who used to travel around the world, went to visit with them. Our relatives, there. they'd done Copra and something and done very well. Yeah. But mm -hmm. that was way back. It was called Greg Island on old maps. It's been changed now. But anyway, I never know did Scotland get out there quite myself. Well. I have been oh, you know often. Scotland, yeah? The University of Leiden mm. made the University of Scotland. No, really? Edinburgh. Is that true? Yes. Really? And Leiden was uh, initiated by Vienna. Okay. Uh, Vienna came in. Uh, 1564, okay. when Holland became a country, was started to become That's a country. early. There 80 was a... years we had the war to become independent. Yeah, an early university and of Bologna. so Vienna came yeah. and uh, started Leiden. That's yeah. the oldest university. I didn't, the oldest university in Europe? Older in, than, no, 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 in no, Holland. In Holland, well, Vienna yeah. was Bologna, uh, already... Uh, there was one in Bologna, too, I think, oh, early, yes, in, 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 the in Italy. Yeah, 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 it goes but, way back. Uh, so, mm. from, from there to Scotland, and I know quite a few Scottish people, and I used to visit there often. Did you know uh, Harry Lauder, the singer? Were you familiar no, with Harry no, Lauder? No. You don't know Harry Lauder? No. The singer? Roman in the gloaming? No. Roman in the Loman. I, I was not very uh, artistic. Oh, I see. You weren't artistic. <laughs> you were scientific. I know a lot of scientists. Okay, okay. So. Yeah, I was raised on Harry Lauder. Anyway, yeah. that was really good. And then you became interested in psychiatry from your Dutch uh, uncle? Yeah, from my uncle. From your Dutch uncncle, as you, they say. You got yeah. to be a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to be a psychiatrist What did you want initially. to be? I wanted to be, I was tested uh, three, four days. They wanted to know how I was doing. I hadn't been in school. Yeah. And they said, you have to be either a businessman or a lawyer. Oh, my gosh. And the uh -huh. third choice was medicine. Mm. And my uncle said, well, there's no question. You have got to do medicine. Yeah. Uh -huh. I'm very happy uh -huh. about the choice. Uh, although I'm not averse to business, neither am I averse to law. No, but there, yeah, you have adver you have a certain kind of feeling. Yeah, I, yeah, right. I understand. Yeah. yeah. And so um, you were scientifically inclined. Or? I was scientifically very inclined, mm -hmm. but um, because of my background, I decided to become a missionary, and uh, my. Uh, uh, Dutch professors uh, were not interested in me because I was going to leave the country. Lucky enough, you were doing medicine, pre-med or something. We call yeah, pre-med. I did medicine. Yes. You did medicine. You took an M you took an MD. MD in 1955. 55 after 46, so it was nine yeah. years or so. Nine right? years. I had yeah. to go to uh, uh -huh. high school yet. Yeah. And. Uh, and, so, and where did you go at the university there in in Holland? Uh, right? Amsterdam. You had to you had to learn a, a Dutch. Did oh, no, you I know knew Dutch. Dutch. You knew Dutch. Dutch, okay. So Amsterdam University. 45 languages your, he, your father knew, yeah. he could speak? Uh, I, I, the vernacular yeah. and everything? And then uh, everything. I mean, uh, he was a Japanese. He, he learned Japanese when they invaded, and he was the official translator. Uh, there's books written about him, mm. uh, but they didn't care. When, when he had di diarrhea, it was, of course, amoeba dysentery. Yeah. He died with that because uh -huh. he could have easily gotten yeah. something. But when you, if you got, if you got, I once said, when I was young, I hitchhiked all through Europe and the Middle East and so forth. I got a ride with a guy who had been born in Iraq. He was Armenian. He had learned language. He had gone to Europe and done business. And he was driving with a truckload of really good stuff back to Iraq. And he told me he could speak, and he was speaking to me in beautiful, idiogrammatic English. He said he could speak 24 languages. 
idiogrammatic. And he says, if you learn one, it gets easier to learn another when the more you know. I wonder if that's a lesson in, in, you know, in pedagogy or in learning or something. The more you know in a pattern kind of way, the easier it is to pick up. And would that apply to other things like learning patterns within science or within other disciplines? Well, that? yes, that's definitely you know, true. And it's I good have, to use the mind. The yeah. more you, you can't use it too much, I don't think. Absolutely. You it's not like a gas tank. No, you mm. have to use it constantly, and uh, I have developed many hobbies, that's number one, but mm. also historical and philosophical. I've written philosophy, I've uh, mm. been busy with a book about American philosophy, which mm. I think is very important to look at. Uh, uh -huh. most, most Americans don't look at it. Right. Uh, I've done psychology, of course, and animal behavior. Yeah. I've worked on animal behavior. So uh -huh. you, many of these areas have right. been... Uh, right, you did, you did a doctor's degree. Is the same as here. To be, did you become a psychoanalyst or no? No. No, no. but you I, became I a psychiatrist. I did get psychoanalytic training at Yale. Oh, you did? Because uh -huh. uh, I was a fellow there, a research fellow, mm -hmm. and they wanted me to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, Europe is not analytically oriented. I beg your pardon? Europe... Oh, it's not, not analytically not, oriented. Even though Freud's from there, right? Yeah, although Freud is from there. Yeah. But basically, uh, Europe is very much uh, practically oriented. The psychoanalysis was not something that would work. So I was brought up in work therapy. Okay. Uh, all the patients, I lived on an in institution. Mm -hmm. All the patients were working. Mm -hmm. I played soccer with them. Mm -hmm. I uh, did gardens with them. These were patients. No, your, I, oh, they were the patients. Yeah, with the patients. Just to understand oh. them, because um, in those days people were just uh, hospitalized. Yeah. There was no other. There was no therapy. Right, right, right. Yeah. And uh, I was there in the beginning of uh, the first therapy that I saw in 1953. That was. Uh, uh, the first uh, uh, c chemical therapy. And that that, that associates with uh, Dr. Uh, Klein. No. Nathan it's Klein? The association knows? was in 1960 when I came to this country. Oh, yeah, but he, I associate but him he, with that. Yeah, he in turn, invented the first, very important, he invented the first antidepressant. Okay, which was that called? That was called Nardil. Okay. It is a, an a MAO inhibitor. Today it's not used practically, right. uh -huh. but it is very good. And he got the Alaska Award for it. Yes. And he was getting ready for the Nobel Prize, mm -hmm. but he died, unfortunately, in 1983. I did and, a program uh, with him in yeah, 1975. Yeah. Way back, 19, he was a fine gentleman, yeah. Fine gentleman. And I, I worked also, with him and for him as a medical. Uh, he, I was his medical right hand. Oh, really? Okay. I was his medical director. Mm -hmm. I worked with him from 1961 to 1973. Uh-huh. You also apparently read of Teilhard de Chardin. Oh, yeah. Phenomena Man in that. Yes. Now, that's, that's branching out into comprehensive philosophy, and I know you have a penchant for that. Yes. Thinking about things in big patterns, right? Absolutely. He was a marvel. He was a marvelous Absolutely. inspiration to me. Yeah. yeah. Still is. Very I don't know good. if he's well Very enough good. recognized, but... And he fit uh, my uh, secondary interest, which Nate Klein uh -huh. allowed me to do, okay. uh, which is psych parapsychology. And I did it on, oh. the, on the grounds, and we had this one famous meeting. Uh, all the important people came together to test something, which was the so-called uh, uh, vitamin B3 uh, cure of schizophrenia. Introduced vitamin by, B3? Yeah, vitamin B3 yeah, cure okay. yeah. of schizophrenia. Uh -huh. And everybody was talking about it. This yeah. was 1964. 64, and, uh, okay, yeah. It uh -huh. was introduced by Hoffman mm -hmm. uh, in Canada and, and somebody in, at uh, Princeton. And it was supposedly working. So we tested it. I was the head of the testing. Really? So all these famous uh, yeah. doctors, yeah. I, I knew them practically all at that mm -hmm. time. But it was came. just getting started, really. We, Okay. When did we first understand in the history, right? I know uh, uh, Oliver Sacks. Do you know yeah. Oliver? Yeah. Oliver Sacks. But when did we know the way the brain works in terms of the existence of neurotransmitters and so forth? 50s. And when did, 1950s. When, we didn't know before that no. how the brain worked. No. We were just in the dark. Well, we had, it we seems had amazing to me. It electroencephalography. Seems, right. Encephalography. So we knew that there was electrical activity going yeah, on. Yeah, but we didn't know but it specific. why. Yeah. And the chemical background is actually only found in the war and afterwards in World War II mm -hmm. because of uh, poisonous things like really? LSD. 
LSD was Hoffman, Hoffman again. Yeah. yeah, there was Hoffman in Switzerland. Yeah, but that was Hoffman in Switzerland. 48. This Hoffman is 48. This Hoffman is different. Yeah, Knows different Hoffman. Already in 1944, uh -huh. in, during the war. Uh -huh. And he... About the neurotransmitters. Yeah, well, Which no, he the knew first that, we that the brain was influenced by... Uh, by uh, poisons, and oh, then I they see, found yeah. the uh, uh -huh. uh, the uh, other poisons uh -huh. like uh, the Mexican uh, mes Mexican uh, mes mescaline, mescaline, and all yeah, these other yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. And that's where the theory started. Mm -hmm. that, that's when the what started? The theory started. Theory started. That there was something wrong chemically in the brain. You mean in terms of some mental disorders? Correct. That yeah. was 1952. That uh -huh. for the first time, some people wrote about it. Very good people. I've met three of the four. Mm -hmm. uh, they are all past now. Yeah. And they wrote a theory that the brain basically was chemically influenced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They used the example of poisons, and they gave one example of a treatment that had been found, which was a stimulant. Uh -huh. And that was Ritalin, Ritalin and Dexedrin. And those were found and were used in World mm -hmm. War II by uh, yeah, pilots. to, to get people fight awake yeah, yeah, and fight they, and they, alert. They couldn't stay awake, especially the Japanese and the Germans. What if you? I could give you. Uh, I could throw some things out, and you could set me straight because you know I don't know. I'm guessing, but uh, in terms of the brain, the human brain, it seems to me there's something like ten to the tenth power neurons, and they're not in. The, they're they're not hardwired. There is between them axions that interconnect them as a system, and then there's a thing called the synaptic cleft. And the, any state of mind, a state of mind can be biochemical modeled by the ratio of the neurotransmitters that appear in the synaptic cleft and the uptake. And if, you're, if you win the lottery and you're happy because you got a lot of money or a lovely lady or whatever, you, that state of mind can be modeled uh, in terms of understanding the ratios of the neurotransmitters in the synaptic cleft of the... Millions. You're absolutely right. Is that is that is that a more, more or less a summary that of the way a, the brain a very works? Good summary, but we have moved very far from it. I would think so. Yeah. Uh, in the first place, uh, the uh, the theory is right, and that's the beginning of all the discoveries of the uh, uh, substances that improve it. So we have now about forty or fifty different. Uh, at the depressants, Nathan Klein is the first one, but there's many yeah, more, yeah. and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Then, secondly, we found out that the brain is very plastic. Mm -hmm. The great plasticity, it can change. Mm -hmm. Now, when I went to medical school in 1948, there was no change in the brain. Right, it, right. At age 18, it started deteriorating, yeah. and then from there on in, you were dead. Yeah, okay. right. Yeah. Now, it's not true now. We mm -hmm. know that the brain can restore itself. Mm -hmm. We have seen that in Christopher Reeves, when he walks around. Before his death, I saw him on television, uh -huh. and he walked around, be it with some instrumentation, yeah, yeah. but nevertheless, he mm -hmm. had broken his mm -hmm. neck uh, in the past. Yeah, with a horse, a, a horse machine, event. Yeah, yeah. But he walked, uh -huh. and he died a year later right. because of a pneumonia, not yeah. because of the brain. Uh -huh. So we know that the brain is uh, possible to uh, to regrow itself. The main point is, and very important, discovered in 1966 thereabouts, that the brain big cells, of which there are about 10 billion, yeah. the brain's big cells, mm. the neurons. Yeah are being fed by the brain's smallest cells, the glia. Glia, okay. Now, in before the time, yeah. everybody thought that glia was just filling, like when you sent a post, uh, post uh, package, you put some wool in there yeah, so yeah. that the yeah. glass doesn't yeah. break. Yeah. One felt that this glia was filling it. Uh -huh. They didn't know what the function was. But a smart lady yeah. who won the lower prize later, 20 years later, hmm. um, that is uh, Mrs. Uh, Lady Montalcini, mm. an Italian who came after World War II to this country yeah. to study, she found that the glia actually makes the substance that makes the neurons live. Makes the substance. Makes the well, substance. all of the cells are going to have to be fed in the normal thing with uh, the gas passage over the cells and everything. That Absolutely. would have to no, be. No. Yeah. The interesting point: the neurons live uh -huh. because of the glia cells. Uh -huh. However, the neurons can only function f for two reasons: we eat glucose, uh -huh. sugar, right. and we breathe oxygen. Right. Without oxygen, you're dead in eight minutes. Yeah, right. And without sugar, you're dead in an hour. Sugar is good for you? Oh, must be. It is good. I love sugar. I love hot fudge sundaes. Right. Is well, that good? 
Well, I love hot fudge Sundays with cherries yeah, on yeah. top. Well, Is I love them too, but yeah, I, yeah. unfortunately, mm. I can't because for other reasons, mm -hmm. I can't do that mm -hmm. anymore. Um, they have but, a thing in, they have a thing called glioma, which yeah. is a kind of cancer that is deadly. That's glia cells. Uh -huh. See, the neurons have never, practically never, cancerous. Uh -huh. They are the cells. Well, they get destroyed because you got a stroke yeah. or something like that. Yeah. But they're not cancerous by mm -hmm. themselves. Mm -hmm. But the glia is very cancerous. Mm -hmm. Glioma, is a really glioblastoma, bad one. a lot of terrible diseases, yeah, and yeah. you die very quickly. Yeah, time. we had a friend who died, very sad. They had yeah. a biopsy, and there were four different kinds they could identify, and they came up with glioma, and he said it's almost hopeless. Yeah, hopeless. I think that's what Mr. Um, uh, Kennedy had, glio, yeah. glio, yeah. yeah. A anyway. couple, couple of months, and that's what. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, it's very tragic, and uh, I have several uh, friends that died of it. Mm -hmm. And I always advised, because there's no treatment, or not yet, I always advised, you know, uh, take a time off, mm. and travel for, for a couple of months but as until a you die. Yeah, but as a psychiatrist, I remember doing a program with uh, B.F. Skinner way back when, up in Cambridge and everything. He thought everything was conditioned response. Or you could go all the way over to, like, Rollo May or, or, or you know, uh, eclectic, but well, he's behavioralist. So, yeah. so you, to say you're a psychiatrist doesn't mean a hell of a lot unless you know what kind of psychiatry well, I'm a you are. Psychopharmacologist. Psychopharmacologist. Well, then you would be aware that, that, that Mr. Yeah. Klein, yeah. Uh, I associate and, and him as with As far that. as Skinner is concerned, mm. he's completely dead. Yeah. Which dead? I predicted. I mean, his theory is out the window. He once wrote a book, Beyond Freedom and Dignity, yeah, I, which I thought was really a nonsense. funny title. Yeah, a funny it's title. Because yeah, yeah. He strives for freedom. Mm. Them yeah, and yeah, dignity. Yeah. But the point was, he thought that everything was a reflex, yeah. which is wrong. But didn't he lead to behavioralism? Is yes. there a lot of behavioralism, behavioralism alive and well? It's gone. Well, there's an awful lot of that industrial engineering and how you're going to oh, yes. get people to do things in the right way. And a lot of the sergeants in the army think it's very good to be able to condition people. He, everything's conditioned response or something. And a lot of people still think that way. Yeah. It seems well, to it me. It is. But, yeah. Certainly in the army, where you have to be disciplined. Uh, you have to have conditioned responses. I used to try Police to, has no. conditioned responses. Mm. There are jobs that you need conditioned responses. But in general, mm -hmm. that is not the essence of human beings. Are you saying the conditions we need in order to fit into a good job role? Because if you begin to look at it, the, the corporation is structured very much like the Army. You have a senior vice president, a vice president there, and you have control, you have commands, you have people do right. things. It's very authoritarian. Yes, but that's yeah. wrong. Because you think Google, it's wrong, right? <laughs> we know it's wrong okay. because Google has an absolutely uh, non Mm. Authoritarian structure, and they haven't got and it. Yet, they haven't hardly made a mark in the world yet. Right. We're well, still waiting them for. Yeah, I'm, making a, making, joke, a I'm making, yeah. know, so, was, making a joke, sir. I'm making. I know, and I was. I'm making a joke. Google yeah. is huge. So, but that is because of. They, they have a totally different organization. Let's not go into that. But uh, the point is, the authoritarian organization is yes, it's based on conditioning, and it's slowly leaving us, because we all people. We all have a lot of <coughs> thoughts and uh, better the world with these thoughts. Yeah. Unless you allow them to bloom, mm -hmm. you don't get anywhere. And, mm. and my best example is always Bill Gates. This, this fellow... He dropped 20, out of university. Yeah, he dropped out of Harvard in his first year. In 20 years, from nothing, he was a the richest man in the world. Do you think gauging uh, success in the world in terms of human purpose is uh, closely associated with economic return? That if you make money, that's a good general... Gen in this country, uh, it in is. In this country, because that's the... Ma is that the major motivation force in world society, is money? No. No, and that holds it together? No, it holds it together, because... I mean, it's the one that coheres it, and everything will... Uh, everybody will associate with that before almost anything else? Not uh, yeah, in, in our terms culture, of, in the Western culture. Yeah. In the Western person, culture, okay. They really begin to get, get the same approach uh, with different uh, nuances. Mm. But the fact is, yes, you need the money to live a life. And the United States has shown that once you live a life free, you grow so fast and you can so much increase in what you have that you have a time 
to start thinking. Well, about the goods of civilization beyond just the goods of uh, goods and services. Right. So you like start art thinking. And thinking. Large, you can start, and you start yeah, giving your money away. And is it? Yeah. Well, you have to get money to give it away. That is yeah. true. But a lot of things. Artists, the starving artists, started. They're, they're believing in bohem and all this. They're believing in these kind of things. Love. Things like love, you haven't got time for love, you have to do, make right. money. That's the thing, and well, you have to do, that's responsibility, and you learn that to accept responsibility to an authority figure in the educational process, yeah, unfortunately. even elementary, unfortunately. and all the institutions are authoritarian, essentially. Right. Corporations authoritarian. Yeah. Unfortunately, because very many people have uh, not benefited from that system, including our great, uh, uh, forefathers, hmm. the people who made the revolution. Yeah, yeah, well, they made they, a revolution. They never went to school, oh, but they, they, <laughs> had, they knew their stuff. They knew their stuff really well. They had, well, that was the Enlightenment coming, Hume and all that, yeah. coming out of Scotland. And yeah, they, absolutely. I didn't know Edinburgh was, was from, uh, was from, from uh, uh, Belgium, Edinburgh, was Edinburgh from was Netherlands. was born from Leiden, yeah. Well, I know, that's good. I guess and, and, and the interesting point, of course, uh, when William of Orange Mm. took over England, mm. we, we could have been uh, the masters of England because mm. William of Orange, when he came in, mm. uh, the English made him a uh, perpetual king mm. and his uh, progeny would mm. be perpetual king. Yeah, Unfortunately, he had zero progeny. <laughs> <laughs> Four. Shucks, huh? Yeah, so yeah. We, we That's lost too bad. it. Uh, had, uh, fickle finger of fate, right? Yeah. We had a lot of fights. We had six wars with England. Mm. Uh, Holland, mm. and then later we um, we got together and we do a lot of things together. Uh, Holland's a very progressive country, is it not? Yeah, it's got a reputation for that being very tolerant, very very uh, tolerant. No. Yes, yes. No. And uh, but now I wouldn't live in Holland. This is very overcrowded and it's very Muslim. Very, very Muslim. Muslim. Now you were you were raised among Muslims. I right? was in raised in a Muslim country. What does country. it mean to be Muslim in Europe? I mean, very Mos to for a country to be very Muslim in Europe. Oh, uh, they, that that uh, one they are going to die. You probably read uh, the book of uh, America Alone by uh, by uh, what's his name Stein. No, I haven't okay. seen it. No, uh, he wrote years ago that Europe is dying. Dying. Why? Because we allow in Europe and not in the United States. Mm -hmm. We allow in Europe, most countries, uh, to, that Muslims have many more than one wife. They have four wives. Uh -huh. I was in Edinburgh in 1956 with my wife, and we eating in a restaurant, and uh, it was a good restaurant, it was a Pakistani restaurant. Mm. And so I said to the waitress, I said, that is great, mm. this is fantastic, uh, maybe we can talk to the cook mm. and congratulate him on this good food. Okay, she says, that's my husband. Okay, so he came out and we congratulated him, my wife and my and very fine food and so on. Yeah, he says, that's very nice. My uh, other wife is, uh, <laughs> The bookkeeper, mm -hmm. you see sit, her sitting, so she came over from mm -hmm. the corner, she's mm -hmm. the bookkeeper. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, so you have one that is a waitress and the other one's the bookkeeper. Yeah, he says, I have two more. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> and they do that and that in the household. He had four wives. I think that's what they had. Yeah, go yeah. on, yeah, that's okay. it. Yeah. So, in Europe, that is allowed. And it is, really? I give you 1956, it was allowed at that time already. Mm -hmm. And we brought thereby, I think we, because I still feel very much for Europe, I think it's a lost continent. Uh, really? That's yeah, interesting. Unfortunately, unfortunately. Ah, ah that's interesting. Yeah. But, uh, because of the Muslim thing, you think? Well, because really? of the Muslim and also other things, they yeah. were, they <coughs> were too, um, and Holland is part of it, they were too, uh, uh, expansionist by making a 25 country European Union. You think so? Where yeah. Now all the other states that can't produce as Germany does. Germany is the Germany is the engine. Holland is the engine. Well, yeah. Ireland used to be an engine, but Greece. Greece is in trouble. Poland, now, yeah. you, um, the Latvia, and so on. They yeah. are all in trouble. Spain well, is in trouble. So they're falling apart. And I predict that the euro will go under. Really? Yeah. But I also it's being, that the it's dollar being will challenged. go under. So yeah, that's, okay. That's well, that's all. The, yeah, but you know, like we had, we had here in the United States too, because I was from Detroit, well, you know, 
And that was uh, the center of industrial, I mean, it was one-sixth of the economy or something with automobile. And then there were places at that time then in the south of the United States that were poor, yeah. relative. Yeah. But then they went there. Yeah. And then that's a metaphor for, I mean, uh, how small a geographical section can there be people who are well organized politically and economically to be viable and grow? And how much are you then able to include the whole of the human society with people? You've got Africa, you've got other parts of the world, you've got Indonesia. You know, how, that's a big issue in terms that of how are we issue. going to deal with the world. We've got 7 billion heading for 10, apparently, the UN tells us. Right. And an awful lot of people are living on a dollar a day and that they're not being able to take advantage of things. And the way in which we're going to be able to, through integrative studies and so forth, uh, have that work as a system so that we're dealing not only with just the ones who are the leaders in terms of wealth or d development, but with all of humanity is a big issue that's philosophically important. Makes very think important, of, very you know, important. And so to write face, some off is not such a good idea, I think. Uh, let's face one important thing. In uh, 1969, I organized a great symposium. I used to organize lots of symposia yeah. for the uh, uh, <clears throat> American uh, Society of Science. Uh, okay, uh, good. And uh, we had a speaker, John Calhoun, uh, he's the one who uh, introduced the uh, uh, mice colonies, and we know that the mice colonies, if you overload them, mm -hmm. they lose aggression and they lose procreation. Uh -huh. uh, if you have seven yeah. room only, yeah, yeah. they don't have aggression, they don't fight anymore, but they don't procreate uh -huh, either. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And you can find they have normal uh, reproductive organs, but mm -hmm. they don't have the activity anymore. Mm -hmm. And he therefore said, uh, under some portion, and it's very good. I have it in my book. Hmm. Um, you got a book you brought this one, the Chico? No, no, this no, is the Chico. We'll the talk other about one is just. Uh, but the, the important point was he said in 1969 that the world's top population would be 10 billion. Hmm, that. There was a, a cacophony. We had 7,000 people in this hall. Yeah. And they were shouting, you know, you are terrible because. They were population control. Yeah, and Paul Ehrlich, pa that, Paul Ehrlich oh, type yeah, people. All these people. Yeah. Oh, oh, this and that. Shades of Malthus. Huh? Yeah, mm. tremendous. And his argument is: Look, people will be like mice when they grow together and grid, then they will not procreate anymore. So mm -hmm. he predicted that after. 2010, as a matter of fact, that's now, mm -hmm. slowly but surely we would reach 10 billion mm -hmm. at the most. And that's slowly what the UN is projecting for 2020. Down. Yeah, they're projecting 10 billion. Yeah. They, we will not have more than 10 billion. No, and, you that's know, what they're it, saying at a level off. 1969, yeah. Heinz von Furster, who was a very good uh, friend of mine, uh, wrote an article in Science. J. Uh, Forrester? Forster, F O E R S T E R. J. No, not not J. Forrester. Jay For Did you know no. J. Forrester? I know him too. Yeah. I did a program yeah, with yeah. J. Forrester. Yeah, he's good. He's my good. hero, my that was way, uh, uh, yeah. end of uh, gr uh, the limits to growth and the Club of Rome. Absolutely. All that stuff and everything. Yeah. I did a program. And my hero was Bucky Fuller. Yeah, I know. It still is. I still think he's the best that's ever put he it is together. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. And then uh, Chardin, I'd like to but read. But I just it. wanted to say. Go that ahead. In man. 1969. 1967, von Furster had published with another fellow uh, an article that standing room only in 2020. The guy named Cohen. It, it, yeah, it, something it, like it, that. It, it, 2020, standing room only. Yeah. And there is Jack Calhoun predicting uh -huh. maximum 10 billion and mm. then drop off. Uh -huh. Jack Calhoun was right, von uh -huh. Furster was wrong. Uh, both were good friends of mine. Mm. And, uh, Who? Roosevelt. Hmm? Did you say Roosevelt was a good friend of yours? No, no, Furster. Oh, Forrest. Jack Calhoun and von Furster. Okay. I remember, I, I like, I, I really like Buckminster Fuller with his world game findings and that kind of thing and his Absolutely. thinking. And he's got a ephemeral. Genius. A he's, genius. Got, he's got a, uh, he's a comprehensivist. He's thinking very large patterns Absolutely. and he's thinking anticipatorily and he's thinking design. And he's thinking about, and he's done that. And then he got kind of political toward the end of his life. But among other things, he, 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 in the world game, the world design science uh, decade, 1965-75, it was a major study done by academics and intellectuals that was taking the trend or taking the measure 
of everything in a non-ideological or larded way and like population trends, new materials, all this sort of thing and they made projections and one like Galileo is remembered not for the, art, the, uh, uh, the pathways of Jupiter but for saying we don't go around, you know we're not the center of the universe that's right. the big paradigm his major paradigm that he'd be remembered for he died in 83 was that he said in 1952 that he took a measurement and then you talk a world population and he took uh, he's got a chart and he had it he put it in Fortune magazine and it was what we call the haves and the have-nots now we were talking about that with Muslims in Europe or you know right. the wider world. So you have haves and have nots and how you get a definition of what a have is or how you do that in economic terms. But he said we were making progress out of history in the percentage of the world population because of technology, new developments that could real, real, realistically be seen to be haves in terms of our capability through time as an axiomatic thing. And he said, but we reached 10% coming out of history by the First World War, 20% by the Second World War. And in 1952, he made a projection. He said, we were going to reach on this chart, world population, haves, have nots, a lot of detail in that. Uh, and he said, we are going to reach the point where there will be the 50 percent mark. There will be, in terms of our collective capability, more haves than have-nots for the first time in 200,000 years of human existence. Yes. That in a certain sense he could be saying we're going to be in a certain sense, particularly new materials and things coming, we are going to be transcending material scarcity as an ontologic reality. Absolutely. That's like Chardin in a way, yeah, he's talking about absolutely. convergence. But he made that point. Uh, Jay Forrester did a program and he said that, you know, okay, so that's the thing. I still think that. We crossed that line no, about 19... We, we crossed that line about 1970. That's the same time when the weapon systems almost by the modeling became species lethal. Yeah. That was a major moment in the, in the evolution of events and everything. But I presented to Jay Forrester and he said, um, I presented to Jay Forrester this thing and he had written Limits of Growth. He wouldn't say it on camper. He wouldn't say it on camera, but he would say it off camera. And he said, we'll never be able to transcend scarcity and have a world where people can have, and the ecology, the creatures, that were, were, were without, without the, the in authoritarian structures of our institutions inherited out of history, it was all zero sum. For one to lose, some, uh, somebody to gain, somebody else had to lose. You get to non-zero, you're getting to a world where everybody in a certain sense could realize their own given potentiality, what they want to do rather than what a pro... He said you can never get to that because of the population. He said the reason that people have smaller babies when you get on to industrialization is because essentially um, uh, they, they get on the fast track and they get, it's essentially they get down to where they're so materialistically oriented and so forth that they, it's better to have a Buick, that's a, a yeah, fancy sure, car, yeah. than a baby. Yeah. Yeah. So they get so on that, and that if ever we get to the point where they can have, and let's just think a thousand years out or something on the trend of technology and everything, we're not still going to be worrying about how somebody gets a piece of bread to eat or something if we're here, if we don't blow it up. Yeah. So think that way. But he said you can never have that if everybody had the little house with the creek and the pony and everything was just great and everything, hey, Ma, to play in and Judy Garland, kind of, right. you know, all that, they would have it. They, they would realize, and they didn't have to uh, become, they, you, had to, you had to keep them alienated by following the industrial pattern of, you know, the, 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 the corporate thing and everything. They had to keep them alienated because if they ever realized that they could live their life, let's say, with leisure, doing what they want and everything, they'd realize babies are good things and they'd breed us off the planet. We've got to keep the little bastards alienated in the, in the rat race, okay, and get everybody into the rat race, or they will, if they ever become uh, liberated, they would just breed us off the planet. He no, made that argument. He wouldn't say it on camera, but he said but it off camera. Jack Calhoun was precisely the opposite. Okay. He says, as soon as we develop uh, conceptual space, mm -hmm. cognitive space, mm -hmm. we will not populate anymore. Okay. And he predicts that, uh, like in the year 5,000 or so, 6,000, there will be only a few people in the world, the rest will live on different planets and they I will see. all communicate, but there may be in the whole universe, maybe only a handful of people. Oh, that's because 
everything is taken over by machines mm -hmm. and done. And the only thing that we do as people, mm -hmm. he says, will be thinking more and more about conceptual space. Well, what does that mean, conceptual, conceptual space? space? That it's a space that we create. Virtual you know, realities? Uh, no. Yeah, no. You can, virtual reality mm. is one form of it. Mm. But everybody has conceptual space. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of space in thinking about Muslim uh, ethics because I don't believe they are a religion. Mm. I believe they are an ethic. And uh, what will happen if we don't realize that that is so. There are some people who say yeah. that, uh, okay, the so thing So I have a, yeah. have a whole terrain, uh, and most people don't even think about it. Well, that would be the no sphere. Yeah. And Mr. Chardin right. recognized right. that would be exactly. the thinking, that was part of the and thing. And there is no end it, to it. Yeah, it goes, it goes like that, and that's where, it, so. And, and the other thing why I don't, may I say mm, something mm. about Forrester, I don't mm. agree with him, because I, in, when I was in Indonesia, mm -hmm. we had regular uh, famine, China, famine, yeah. India, That's famine. That's horrible. Today there's no famine. Mm. There may be uh, disasters, yeah. but uh. there's no famine. Mm -hmm. Nobody dies. Mm -hmm. So that is not true, and, and that's you my, must life, have death in my in the, lifetime. There has to be death in the evolutionary process, or one yeah. system could overrun uh, the whole thing. Right, but they will not, because we will have enough of this uh, biology sphere. Mm. We will live in a noosphere. Noosphere, that's we knowledge. Will not, yeah. Just like that's the mice, Chardin, yeah. not the mice and the rats do not procreate anymore mm -hmm. when they have standing room only. Uh -huh. Why? With Complete, everything's complete. Mm -hmm. they, 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 they did all the testing, mm -hmm. and uh, Axelrod, actually, the Nobel Prize winner in, in uh, uh, physiology, did all the testing for, yeah. uh, for Calhoun in, uh, in Washington, D.C. Calhoun, I think I know that. I think Axelrod. I may have met him once. Yeah, I think, he's I think, wise man, I think, the wise man. Yeah, mouse. I think and so, he yeah. Said, you know, yes, I did. I do remember. Yeah, yeah I forgot. He's yeah, a very good friend. I do remember that back in the '70s yeah. or something. Yeah. It was. Very I think good. when yeah, there was yeah. even a movie. Calhoun. I think I've got him. Remember in the my, movie? I did a program with him. I think it's yeah. in my list, but it's so by far ago I forgot. There's a movie about him. Okay. The, uh, and, and, and and that the mice uh, occupy. That's Washington, right. That's DC. right. Yes, yeah. that's right. I remember that because we were talking about those things. Yeah. But but anyway, I wonder. <laughs> I did a program with the poly. I like polymaths. I like people who think big. And you were one. And you. You've got known a lot of other Chardin and Fuller and that right. kind of thing. McLuhan was good. Right. James Joyce, poets, that kind of thing. And um, um, you, you, Jay Forrest, I mean um, 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 Asimov. Uh, Asimov, ah. He was no. wonderful. Oh, no, we did a program, Isaac Asimov, and we did a program with him, and he said that this is the defining, uh, the defining generation. I think he might have went from 1970 to 1920, 50 yeah. or something like that. This is the defining generation in 200,000 years of human existence on this planet. Because we finally reached a point with the extension of our capability, the technology. I just visited a, a talk with Jay, uh, Jonathan Shell, who wrote that Fate of the Earth, 1982. Oh, yeah, right, right. Remember that? Very good, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. we get to the point where the weapon systems, which have always led the research, so one tribe could steal from another, or one group could say, mm -hmm. we're better than you, and all that zero-sum thing, uh, is those weapon systems apparently have become, I don't know, it has to be modeled, do you think it's true that if there was an unleashing, like the First World War, in hatred and that kind of thing, there was an it would have to involve the United States of America, but if there was an unleashing, that it would be the end of the Homo sapiens species. Most of the modeling says we probably reached that about 1970, about the same time Bucky Fuller said we were transcending material scarcity as an ontologic reality in 1970. Right. We've been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And that, but that if you if you're into that, you could be putting a thing up non-zero sum, and there could be liberation of the whole of the human society, like the hundred trillion cells that make up the human organism, all of which matter, all the people and the ecology. That we have a transition moment. We're either going to join entropy and blow ourselves up, and we have that capability, unlike as recently as the Second World War and uh, that we're at a time of a qualitative transformation in the evolution, maybe something like punctuated, we're gonna come into a new relationship if we continue to the universe at a level that Mr. Chardin was talking about in Phenomena and Man I and that sort so, of thing. What do you think of all that? Is I this a major so. point of transformation? Absolutely. Because and there's nobody talking about it. Yeah, but look, we are now looking at China as our biggest enemy. 
Mm. And China supposedly, and they make all types of noises about attacking us and so on. Yeah. And they, they do. But don't forget, they're thinking like we do. Mm -hmm. It's over. Oh, they're the on place. our page. They're, they're yeah, on right. our page. And at a certain moment, they're smart enough to understand, hey, we will die if we do this. What for? Mm -hmm. What for? Now we get the question, what for? Mm -hmm. In the past, we fought for land and possessions. Mm -hmm. Even Kissinger was saying the, the only possibility, Henry Kissinger, who otherwise is a great guy, but mm -hmm. in this he's very uh, behind the eight ball, mm -hmm. uh, he was saying that any time we can obtain whatever we want by fighting. It's over. I don't think that any time we can get whatever we want by fighting. Can't be done. And even the Chinese realize that. Now we say, okay, what shall we do? Uh, how much can you keep? How much will I get? Mm -hmm. And we, we're starting to exchange. That's the globalization thing. Mm -hmm. That will not mean that we won't have small wars, mm -hmm. but I don't think we have big wars. You don't think it's going to happen? No. Or, or that there's no. anything? Um, do you think, there, if you think in terms of existential, you think in terms of, an, uh, of a uh, species-wide existential reality that we got to the point where with our cleverness and our projected consciousness in technology that the weapon systems that exist, not inflection points of relativity right. theory or something, but actual systems that exist, here trigger alert, they're there and they could be set off and that they, their capability is species lethal. It's right. not an existential new reality. Absolutely. Absolutely, but the only ones. And they still got them. The, yeah. Yeah, but the only ones, and in still, my opinion, okay. in my opinion, the only ones who still think about a, a winning of the world in that way, if, if doing a last battle, are the Muslims. Okay, that's, that's, the only some, one. that's something worth it. I got a friend who's out there at the, the, the Sekra, it's a, a major university in Indonesia. And it's Jakarta. In, it's in Jakarta, but uh, the university is a famous one. The fam it's like Harvard or something in Indonesia mm -hmm. now. And he's the head of the department there in economics, and he's a Muslim. And one of the things they look at, we've got a system in place. If you're talking zero sum, if there's not enough, there's not enough, that's one thing. If there is transcendent, of scale, if there is more than enough, then that's something else. That I, could be something like what they call liberation and all the uh, I believe prophetic that. projection. We may be living at that time. So if you have that transformation, our institutions, everything we've inherited out of history, everything that's come out of history, let's say before 1970, is out of date with what the future requires. Absolutely. And we do not have any leadership about a world that can be inclusive uh, relative to the future rather than coming out of the past. We drive into the future with our eye fixed firmly on the rear view mirror. On the rear view mirror. Yeah. Mr. So the point is, that this fellow lives in Jakarta, and one of the things is, it's economics. We're just having big debate now about economics. And we've allowed, among other things, usury to come in against the uh, wisdom school prescription against it. And in the West, it's all based on usurious kind of uses of it. Uh, yeah. that. And there, there are many people within the Muslim world, that's 1.5 billion people. I don't think we write them off as savages, or we don't write them off as people like Indians on the frontier, or no good engine but a dead engine, or what attitude we take. We ought to be dialoguing with them, and not with the necessarily the crazies or something, and there's a thing. But we ought to be, there are scholars, and they have systems of structuring, in a design sense, economics as a profession, beyond Keynes, beyond fr the things we're doing in that, that would be able to have, they call it Sharia compliant. It, there could be contributions from them. They do it all them. the time. No, they don't do it well enough. And the accepted order is we call ourselves legitimate. We're, we're imposing on the world, 150 bases around the world, we're doing that, and we're imposing a system upon the world that is out of date with what's required. I so there I might be so. something coming from the Muslim world that will be able to challenge us at the level of basic design of all of our institutions based upon a different kind of system of economics. It's not all negative. No, no. There's a lot of no, propaganda, no, no, no. But, but you've been in, but that's coming out of Indonesia pretty yeah, big now. Yeah, Indonesia, because Indonesia. We need a new economic. Yeah. We need well, a new okay. design. But we need also a new thinking. Yes. It's not uh, like what Ahmadinejad does, uh, based on, hey, we'll make the end times and I will go to heaven. That's all he does. We get a lot of propaganda. Uh, 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 
He's we get a lot of propaganda. We used to do that with the communists. The com you remember Mr. Oak McCarthy? Yeah, but they didn't want we to, did that. And they now didn't it, don't want us to die. They want us to be. Most of those things that Mr. Adam, don't you understand, or do you understand, we are submitted to a barrage of propaganda? Okay. No, because it used, to be, it. it used to be the commies. Now no. it's the Muslims. No, no, no. It I'm is, but you understand that. Yeah, I understand okay. that. But They're I the think, enemy du jour. I think that the difficulty, uh, it will be the Chinese, much more than the Muslims. Well, that's and more they're pragmatic. Economically, they but have they're still just right in our path. You yeah. talk, you think about Qigong. I did a thing about Qigong. They, they're, they're into dialectical materialism. Right. That's their religion yeah. more than Qigong yeah. or spiritual. But that's why I say that the uh, religion of Muslim does not exist. It is not a religion. It's an ethic. Well, it's the a ethic is everybody has to be submitted. Now there is no. No, that's religion. some. That's some say that. They don't all say that. No. No, I there's interpret. Just that. Did you ever see some of the preachers down in, in Arizona, down in Arkansas, or something? They got versions of Christianity that are insane. The Mormons had wives. All it, of this. So you take one little group. It's not. Care. It's there so are intellectuals within the Muslim world that have answers that are relevant to a new why way. Why don't they speak rather up? Than, rather why don't they speak than, up? Well, they're trying, but no. they get buried in a barrage Sorry. of a propaganda, no, no, no. perhaps. Perhaps no. synergetic. Look, we as have long to look. as we have fanatics that mm. are willing to die, and because they die, they promote themselves. These people dare not speak. Take Salman Rushdie. He, he, we don't know where he lives because he dare not speak anymore. Well, those are crazies. We're not talking. We, we don't not, know who's the, the crazy? The threat, the threat is not going to come from the crazies that are talking. Hey, they, that's not no, the crazies. They're not going. That's that's that's. A alienation. The threat is going to come to the basic structure of Western civilization from the intellectuals. There's nothing coming from within the intellectual community of yeah, the West don't they that is relevant up? to the future. It might be coming in a major way, particularly at the level of, of e economics, from the Muslim community, not the crazy, but why not don't the ones they speak that, but up? intellectual. They're trying to. They, they, they can't they cannot. get through. No, That's well, what I'm trying to say. Well, they, look at Arafat. Mm -hmm. Look at our, it's the I best did a example. program with our Arafat. Arafat forever was trying to do something. Mm -hmm. He couldn't because he knows the Constitution says Israel does not exist. <coughs> So he was arguing well, and arguing. Ten look, years of that. Well, C Clinton spent his best thing, they, but he couldn't say it. Well, yeah, so yeah, he but, finally died without well, saying it. Well, I don't it. think we necessarily have to blame it all on the people that are being that way. You might blame it on some of the people, the colonial but, powers. I don't see anybody speak up. For well, the sense. people you want to see speak up are the intellectuals. There but are no intellectuals. Where? Where are they in the West? We don't have oh, any. Oh, yes. Where, yeah. is Bo where is Bucky Fuller? Where is, is Chardine? Where are the intellectuals? Yeah. Now, they're, they're all they're doing stuff. is triumphantly saying, we're good, we're legitimate, the rest of the world is not, get on our game, and they don't have a game worthy of being followed. They need leadership. I don't think that they say that. Okay. I well, don't certainly don't No, they say don't that. say that. They will say they are legitimate. Rome thought they were legitimate. Uh, yeah, yeah, the feudal heads of Europe thought they were legitimate historically. I until, know that there are certain So there's people. a change needed, and the intellectuals are falling down on the job. They're not providing an alternative way of forming capital and distributing income in a way that can bring demand and and bring a liberated human humanity well, rather ISIS, than the ISIS meeting yesterday. The ISIS meeting was showed a, something. We've run out of time. Yeah, right. That's one of the problems, the right. tyranny. We don't yeah. have time. No, I place. agree with you, but the, 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 maybe the voices are also not so much. And in public access television is a place where